Um, in Moscow, circa the 1990s, um, who happened to be radical nationalists, um, straight out of a, a kind of a, a Dostoevsky novel or a probably more 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 reliably a, a Richard Linklater film um, about you know not not the, the more recent Richard Linklater films about sort of good-looking people wearing bell-bottom jeans, but the earlier Richard Linklater films about kind of obsessive people and edgy intellectuals. Um, this these are, are people who had a very fearsome vision of Russia uh, and wrote pamphlets and blogs about it, uh, which very few people paid any attention to uh, in the 1990s, uh, in the 1980s, about what they were saying. Um, but for whatever reason, this is a vision of, of Russia, a vision of Russia that has in some sense come to pass about a decade and a half later. It's a vision of Russia that has Russia as a, 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 an aggressive, militaristic, Eurasian power, um, uh, fighting wars with its neighbors, uh, having military adventures in, in the Middle East, uh, isolating itself from the international community, sealing itself off from the West. Um, this is a, a vision of Russia that would have been very pessimistic. Had you had I been saying that this was going to happen five years ago, I would have uh, probably uh, not been. You know, the, the, I, I wouldn't have predicted that this w would have happened five years ago, and very few people had. But for whatever reason, this he started using buzzwords and phrases and terms and arguments that these writers were using. Um, uh, words like uh, Eurasia. Uh, in 2011, he declared that Russia was going, eventually going to be part of a Eurasian Union. Um, a, a word called the, saying that Russia was a civilization state rather than a nation state. Uh, this is actually quite a loaded term. Uh, it, it, it indicates that there's a certain amount of, of pessimism about uh, Russia's future as a proper kind of Western style nation state. Uh, and and it, rather the, the the concept of a civilization is is more appropriate to Russia's uh, sense of of its um, of its destiny. Um, he uses words like uh, passionarnost, which I can't translate to be honest. It's a <laughs> of a, a, a mentality, a, a sense of sacrifice that great nations have, um, which is is actually uh, quite. It has a quite a confrontational kind of uh, tone. Um, and he started using words like this uh, about two years uh, before um, the Ukraine crisis and the invasion of Crimea and um, uh, before Russia started down this, this path that it's on now. Um, now these writings, uh, he, there, there's a group of, of authors, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them later. There's a, a man named Alexander Dugan, who I know who former KGB figures and to uh, the military, but I wouldn't say that he's particularly plugged into the Kremlin, um, and he is the first person to, to den deny that he is. Um, another man named Alexander Prokhanov, who uh, is actually quite, uh, has quite uh, link, he has quite strong links to the defense establishment. Um, in Russia, uh, another man named Sergei Kurganyan, who's a, a television host, um, uh, himself a, a, a fairly hardline uh, national. How the vision of these these writers and intellectuals um, became implanted in in Russian reality, and and I'm, I'm, it's all the more curious because, as I said, this group has some fairly vague links to the powers that be, but it's they don't have a direct line to Putin. They don't, you know, there's, I, I spent a lot of time, I was, I became interested in this because I thought they did. Uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to uncover the links of these um, uh, radical nationalists to the, uh, the Kremlin power structures. And, uh, and right around the time I became convinced that they actually didn't have any links to the Kremlin, um, Russia invaded Ukraine. And um, it, it, which seems to indicate that there was something to that. But um, nonetheless, there is some complicated process uh, by which uh, these authors, uh, these writers seem to have uh, 
to use, for lack of a better term, they've started to wag the dog. Kremlin using nationalism, you see the opposition to the Kremlin also becoming increasingly nationalist. Uh, the, the, the leader of the opposition, Alexei Navalny, is a, is a avowed nationalist. Um, they use a different, they espouse a different type of nationalism. It's a more ethnic type of nationalism, um, a, a more kind of Russian nationalism rather than a, a Eurasian or a, a kind of pan-state nationalism. Um, but what you're seeing in Russia and uh, and I'll get to this in a bit, what you're seeing uh, in a lot of other countries as well. I wouldn't want to just say, well, in Russia, they're nationalists. And meanwhile, we're here in the US and you know, you've got the rise of Trump and in the UK, you've got Brexit and stuff. So nationalism is happening everywhere in the world. But the, the center of gravity of Russian politics is moving towards nationalism uh, in a very decisive way and has been for about um, Um, and I, I'm just curious about why, why exactly that is and what the links of these writers are because it's, it's actually quite compelling. The, the types of national, you know, now in order to play in, in the Russian political landscape, you have to identify rather than saying, oh, I'm a communist or a, a Democrat or a reformer or something, you have to identify what type of nationalist you are. Um, so, Nationalism is very easy to see, and it's something that's happening. It, it, it happened in Russia. Um, it, it, nationalism is very easy to whip up. It was very easy to whip up in Yugoslavia. It was very easy to whip up in many other countries. It's not something that, um, that then is easy to whip down is the problem. So you can get nationalism going in a country um, in a week, and suddenly, you know, whole communities are separated and, and there's a civil war, but then suddenly, then you can't make the nationalism go away. And so once nationalism takes root in a country, it becomes a very hardened and unretractable social fact um, that's very hard to get rid of. And I think that, and, and so, you know, it starts out as a kind of a postmodern, flimsy concept that um, that people that politicians may use to further their careers but then suddenly it um, once it takes root it's there and you have to deal with it as a social reality and so we're, we're dealing with nationalism in Russia as a social reality now um, so I don't have a good answer about why exactly these authors you know, what exactly the links of these authors to this um, reality is, why their ideas suddenly started, um, you know, uh, entering the mainstream politics. Um, but I will point out a few very interesting coincidences. Um, so the, the, the authors that I'm writing about who are, who are, who are peddling a concept of Russia's national destiny as, as a Eurasian nation, that is a, a part of a, mystical kind of continental Eurasian civilization that is separate, and this is the key, it is separate from the West. It is a non-Western civilization. It has a very unique destiny. This is something that's been written about since um, the 1920s. Uh, a group of white Russian exiles began writing about Russia as, as Eurasia. Um, in the 1920s, the concept was popularized in the, later on in the Soviet Union um, in around the 1970s and the 1980s by a, guy, a historian named Lev Gumilyov, who was the, the son of, of one of the most, probably the best poet, in, in, uh, the best Russian poet of the 20th century, Anna Akhmatova. Um, Eurasia sees Russia as a part of this mystical Eurasian union or core, um, and that, that, that at various times in history was, was, was unified as a, a single empire. So under the Mongols, under the Huns, under the Turks, Eurasia was a single empire, and they see Russia as the kind of unifying core of a new Eurasia. Uh, a new Eurasian empire uh, under that where, where Russian uh, where Russian civilization and, and the Orthodox Church is the kind of unifying um, fundamental uh, 
um, uh, seed of, of that um, identity. Now, this is very weird, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a very strange uh, idea, uh, but it is something that has been consistently written about um, in, you know, uh, by, by some um, very important intellectuals over about a century of Russian history. And it is suddenly kind of broken out into the mainstream. Um, it is not like, this isn't communism, this is not an official ideology where you have entire institutes and universities and departments teaching the theory of, you know, Eurasianism. You have Eurasianism is, uh, is, a, is an idea that is, is kind of, you, it's, it's, it's enunciated in kind of deniable dog whistle fashion. It's, it's you know, when you use the, the term Eurasia in a speech um, or in a book, um, you, you know, or you appoint a certain person to be the head of a university faculty or something like that. That's, it's, it's done in, in that, that way. It's not, a, it's not a public official ideology, but I would say that it is something that a lot of people in Russia um, seem to not necessarily believe, um, but it is, it is kind of in a sense a script that they're reading from. Um, and one of the things that I, I just wanted to mention is, is that if you look at the, the pattern of Russian war fighting in the last decade and a half, um, you see there is a very consistent pattern if you know about Eurasianist theory. So the Eurasianists uh, decided that in the, in the 1920s, they wrote a very famous article where um, they, they, they identified the boundaries of Eurasia as being a line that you draw from the northern city of Murmansk to the Belarusian city of Brest to the western coast of the Black Sea, which everything to the east of that line is Eurasia. Uh, everything to the west of that line is uh, Western, you know, is, is Europe or uh, Romano-German civilization, as they called it then. Um, that line leaves the Baltics out of Eurasia. It leaves Western Ukraine out of Eurasia. It includes Eastern Ukraine. It includes Belarus. It includes Georgia. Every thing that Russia, you know, over the last decade and a half uh, has explained this. Nobody said, you know, Russia does not draw red lines on maps. Nobody does that anymore. That used, that's something that you used to do, in, you know, at the Yalta conference or something like that. But nobody does that now. Russia has never identified a line where it's, you know, its national interests are on one side of this line and everything else is on the other side of this line. Um, but nonetheless, this line seems to exist. And there does seem to be, you know, you, you can explain that line by saying Russia is defending, you know, maybe Russians. But actually, there are a lot of Russians in the Baltics, which Russia has not, you know, you could use the same logic that Russia did in, in Ukraine to defend the Russians in, in, the, in the Baltics um, and say, well, these, these Baltic countries belong to us so, um, because we're defending Russians. But they didn't do that. Um, they've also defended not non-Russians, they've defended Georgians and they've defended Ossetians. And um, uh, so there, there's no kind of, it's, it's very hard to explain the logic of that line that they appear to have drawn, except to say that, that perhaps um, there is some Russian, there is some strategic concept of what Russia is and what Russia's interests are in the present day that seems to coincide um, a theory that was invented in the 1920s um, and um, recently popularized and, and, um, and where, where the, um, the, the min, um, find You can actually tell a lot today by, by intellectuals. Again, as I said earlier, this is something that's happening all over the world. This is, uh, you know, you, you, the nationalism is, is taking hold in countries all over Western Europe, all over, you know, in the United Kingdom, in the U.S. Um, and I think it's, it's important to kind of understand why that is, why politics is swinging to the right everywhere. There, there is a kind of global movement towards this, and this is, this is what seems to be, this is part of the context for why, why this is happening in Russia. Um, 
And I think a lot of studies, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a quote from my, one of my famous, my, my favorite theoreticians of nationalism, Ernest Gellner, who used to teach at, at the University of Cambridge. He said, wherever nationalism takes root, it tends to prevail with ease over other modern ideologies. And that's very true. For some reason, yeah, some other ideology it chases everything out because it's, it's it chases everything out because it's for some fun. And a lot of of idea people would live in an idea. And I think that's the wrong question to ask. I think that people don't actually believe in it. I think I don't think that that Putin believes in Eurasianism. I don't think he's read any of these books, probably. I don't think people around him have necessarily read these books. Um, for whatever reason, they seem to be kind of reaching for these um, words and terms as a, you know, using them for political, as, as political tools, um, but for, for reasons that we don't really understand. And it's, it's not the right question to see, you know, well, why do people believe in this? Because it's obviously not a very good theory. It's, it's been, you know, thoroughly debunked in peer-reviewed journals all over the place. And so um, I guess, and, and I don't really have a good answer for that, why, why people believe in this. Um, it's more that they're sort of acting it out um, and they're kind of using this as a kind of a script, but the way ideas spread is something that we simply don't know enough about. And I think it's something that we could actually spend a lot more time thinking about, is the, the effect of ideas, even very bad ideas, on history. So if you take, um, you know, I mean, history tends to focus on key decision makers or uh, social factors. You know, either you have like the guy at the very top or the, the woman at the very top of, of, uh, of the hierarchy and why they made a certain decision, or you have a very granular kind of socioeconomic reasons why society was moving in a certain direction. Um, and I think the, the, the effect of ideas and writers and culture is probably underappreciated and something that we haven't really researched because it's very hard to get your hands on why exactly how this how this stuff works. Um, but if you put, you know, if you, for instance, if you focus on Putin as a decision maker, um, I think you're focusing on the wrong thing um, because if you if you if you compare two separate crises in Ukraine that happened. Um, 10 years apart. So the first Orange Revolution uh, in 2004, uh, when uh, pretty much exactly the same thing happened, there was a coup against the, the Ukrainian government and the pro-Russian uh, politician um, uh, was overthrown and a pro-Western politician uh, took his place. Russia reacted very differently in 2004. Um, the uh, <coughs> They made noises about Western conspiracies and, and stuff, but in the end, they did not want to upset their relationships with the West and their major trading partners. And it was understood that their main interest was economic, and they weren't willing to sacrifice their economic interests uh, for um, their geopolitical ones. And 10 years later, the same crisis, uh, a pro-Russian politician gets overthrown by a pro-Western uh, movement and um, the Russia's reaction is very different. Suddenly, um, having Crimea is worth, uh, and, a, and a foothold in, in eastern Ukraine is worth the price of, you know, uh, setting Russia's economic goals back 10 years. And we, we always assume that Putin is a pragmatist, that he, um, he has no interest in ideology or big ideas. He does everything for sheer kind of power considerations. Um, but these two key moments in Russian history and how Putin reacted and how the Kremlin reacted in each moment shows that, you know, in both cases, Putin and the Kremlin reacted pragmatically uh, to uh, a crisis or at least, well, I don't know if they react. <laughs> the most recent one, I'm not sure how pragmatic, but we, we sort of assume, we, we, you know, the, the received wisdom on, on Putin and the Kremlin is that they, they are pragmatic. 
it's just this, show, this, this example shows how the definition of pragmatism changed so utterly in, in 10 years that um, suddenly the definition of pragmatism uh, goes from, you know, your economic goals are the most important, so you make noises about, you know, your, your national interests, but actually you don't sacrifice your economic goals for, your national, for, for you know, territory. And then suddenly um, we see exactly the opposite happening. Uh, so, focusing on, on Putin is probably the wrong thing. It's more important to focus on the context in which that decision was made. The context of, uh, you know, Putin has not changed, but the context in which he is, he is acting as a, as a leader has, has changed tremendously. And I think that, that, um, that the, the swing towards nationalism and nationalist ideas in Russian society has been, is, is the key to seeing why that context is now in, in, in trying to understand a lot of countries, uh, not just uh, Russia, but um, the Middle East, why the rise of ISIS, um, why the rise of, of, of militant Islam, why the rise of nationalism overall in a, in a lot of countries. And, and to focus on social factors or to focus on, on the decisions of politicians is probably not the right thing to do. And, 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 and the best way to understand nationalism is actually to um, read their books, uh, to read why, what their arguments are and understand them um, as, as much as, as one can. Uh, it's a bit of a handful, I have to admit. Um, Ideas happen because people think them and because people read them. And, and I think to understand these ideas, you have to be a part of that. Um, you have to kind of put yourself in that ecosystem. You have to put yourself um, in, that, in their world to some extent. Um, so that is roughly what my book is about. Um, you don't actually have to read these guys. You can actually, you know, read my book <laughs> instead um, uh, and, and read uh, what uh, their books are about. Um, but um, I think that that is probably where I'll leave off. Um, it's, uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, I hope I've made some sense. It's, a, it's quite a complicated topic, I do admit. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Charles. I think um, your presentation, like your book, raises some very interesting and difficult to parse questions. So I'm going to turn to Igor and see how much of it he can parse in the next <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you, Ola. Uh, it's a great pleasure to take part in this panel, and reading the book was a treat for me, and I, lot, I learned a lot from it. Uh, and the book, by the way, Charles didn't show it to you. He's so <laughs> modest, uh, but I will show it to you. Uh, it's a very timely book. Uh, the changes in the Kremlin's domestic and international policy after Putin's return to uh, the Kremlin in 2012 surprised both policymakers and academics around the world. And in response, there is a growing body of literature addressing the questions, who is Mr. Putin really? And what is his end game? And Putin's ability to drive uh, Russia's social and political changes is beyond any doubt, of course. But the question is how he does it. And it cannot be explained by not quite democratic nature of the regime only. It's essential to look at broader underlying trends. From my perspective, it's important to look for answers in Russian national identity discourses, and that's why this book is so important to Russia area studies. The predominant discourses of Russian national identity made getting Crimea and the war in eastern Ukraine, as Ted Hopf put it, thinkable, reasonable, and natural. From my perspective, contrary to widespread belief, President Putin does not shape intellectual discourses. Intellectual discourses shape Vladimir Putin. <laughs> 
and the most important component of public attitudes and discourses in Russia today is nationalism and patriotism. But what is Russian nationalism? There are many different nationalisms in Russia. They always exist in plural. And they are changing over time. The subtitle of the book is The Rise of Russia's New Nationalism. And the title of the panel is the same. But I would argue that it is always new. It was new yesterday, it is new today, and it will be new tomorrow. I would also argue that different types of Russian nationalism have been intermingled with each other. They could be seen as overlapping circles of identities rather than mutually exclusive categories. And the same is true about political representation of different kinds of Russian nationalism. We cannot draw a clear line between them. Who is Mr. Zhirinovsky? Is he a Russian ethnic nationalist or neo-imperialist? And the answer depends on what period of his political career we're talking about, on what issue Mr. Zhirinovsky is, talk is talking about, what audience he is targeting, uh, and the most importantly, how he reads the current mood in the Kremlin. So, uh, nevertheless, having said all that, I think for analytical purposes, it is very important to make a distinction between different kinds of Russian nationalism. And I will limit my discussion only to this issue. Uh, the Western media sometimes fail to grasp the basic differences between two main types of Russian nationalism. The first type is statist or государственнический, uh, or to use more derogatory term, imperialist. In the official discourse, it is called patriotism, and uh, many people in Russia call it the same way, patriotism. And nationalism is derogatory term in the Russian language. It's, it is more negative than in the English language. Uh, this school of thought is about maintaining and strengthening a large and strong state. The second type, the main type, is ethnic nationalism concerned not with the state, but with the Russian people, ethnically defined. And Charles' book is about Eurasianism, uh, and the Eurasians, the founders of this school of thought, they differed significantly from other thinkers, but they continue the tradition of non-ethnic, imperial definition of Russianness. It's a big and important tradition, but there are also other traditions. I would not dismiss Russian ethnic nationalists as sometimes, well, Charles <laughs> tend to do. <laughs> Uh, they are not just militant, extremists, far-right, skinheads, and so on. Uh, there is intellectual and theoretical tradition, too. The spiritual predecessors of modern-day Russian ethnic nationalism are the intellectuals, many, mainly writers and poets, and literary critics grouped around the journal Nash Sovremennik in the Soviet times. Uh, and the names include uh, Valentin Rasputin, Vasily Belov, and others. Their moral authority among intellectuals during the Soviet period of time stemmed from the fact that they were anti-communist, they were uh, environmentally conscious, very brave, and in many cases very talented writers. The founding father of ethno-nationalism as a consistent school of thought is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn's uh, outlook appears to be humanistic, inclusive, and moderate. And his major concern was preservation of the Russian people. And arguably, 
Alexander Solzhenitsyn is the first giant figure who challenged the imperial tradition of Russianness, which includes Eurasians. Uh, he condemned the centuries of empire building process as detrimental to the Russian people. However, if his views are applied to concrete geopolitical situation in Eurasia, this perspective may seem a little bit less benign. The essence of the ethno-nationalist project, political program, is to build a Russian state within the area of settlement of ethnic Russians, and probably Eastern Slavs. And that would include not only Russia, but most part of Ukraine, Belarus, and Northern Kazakhstan. By the way, Northern Kazakhstan was always called by Alexander Solzhenitsyn as Southern Siberia. So this is telling. And Solzhenitsyn's intellectual influence on the Kremlin may be some aspects of it, may be as strong as that of Mr. Dugin's, about uh, whom there are excellent chapters in this book. So, what is the current balance between ethnic and imperial layers of Russian nationalism? Many authors have argued that there is a visible movement from primary, primarily statist to primarily ethnic uh, nationalism in Russia today, both in the official discourse and in public consciousness. I have also argued along the similar lines in some of my publications. Uh, actually, the taboo on ethnic nationalism in the official rhetoric was lifted by the president in his Crimea speech on March 18, 2014, in which he claimed that this, as Soviet Union collapsed, quote, the Russian people became one of the biggest, if not the biggest people in the world to be divided by borders. So proclaiming the Russian people ethnically defined as a divided people, it's a very loaded terminology. And Russia is a unifier of the ethnic Russian world uh, divided by artificial state borders seemed to become an official ideology in 2014. However, it turns out that what was true in 2014 is not necessarily true in 2015 and 2016. I have a feeling that a near imperial phase of Russian nationalism is becoming more noticeable once again. This is observable both on society and state levels. And uh, even the images with uh, which the Russian uh, TV builds the Russian identity, they changed in 2015 and 16. Uh, the reports about the Chechens fighting for the Russian world in Eastern Ukraine, think about it, and glorification of the Russian military might during operation in Syria, these are all components of the traditional imperial image of Russia as a large, strong, supra-ethnic state. Vladimir Zhirinovsky, whom I already mentioned in one of his imperial moments, uh, and this is my favorite quote, dismissed the image of Russia, quote, of small villages, forests, fields, fields, accordion player Pyotr, and milkmaid Marfa as a plot propagated by the village writers I talked about a moment ago. Zhirinovsky's Russia, his Russia, is the Russia, is the Russia of historic might, world influence, and impressive richness. His Russia is, quote, an empire with shining palaces of Petersburg, great historical achievements, thinkers of genius, and the leading culture. I love Zhirinovsky. Uh, I think Putin's constructed image of Russia today is similar to this image. After all, he, the president hails from the most imperial city in the world, St. Petersburg, and there is no much place, no room for accordion player Pyotr 
and milkmaid Marfa in the shining palaces of St. Petersburg. So if it is true, if the imperial component of Russian identity is on the rise, the book we are discussing today is becoming a must read for all Russia watches. But it does not mean that the ethnic component of Russian nationalism is in decline. Everything is in flux, and Russian identity is a work in progress. It is multi-layered and fluid, uh, and studying Russian nationalism is a heaven for constructivists. Everything can be reinterpreted overnight. Uh, Mr. Dugin, about him, uh, about whom uh, there are uh, excellent chapters, as I said, in the book, from my perspective, is not Putin's brain, as someone called it. Uh, not Charles, someone else. Uh, the Kremlin brings out Dugin, or Eurasianism, or Solzhenitsyn when needed, and put them back on the shelf in the cupboard. Uh, making a distinction between different types of Russian nationalism is analytically helpful, but at the same time, there is something in uh, common for all kinds of Russian nationalism, and I will just say a few words about that, and I will stop. From my perspective, until his third term, the Russian president was mostly non-ideological, and he was mostly pragmatic. Charles talked about that. Both domestically and internationally, he worked to increase opportunities whenever possible while preserving freedom of action. He was willing to cooperate with the West when it suited Russia's interests, particularly in the fight against international terrorism after 9-11, and I personally believe it was a successful foreign policy. But the, that was in the past. I think that today we see a lot of difference. Just as there are believers who become pragmatists in office, the president has made the unusual reverse journey. After his return to the Kremlin in 2012, uh, the president started promoting a worldview that is often called new Russian conservatism. And it is much more than a random set of ideas. It is an anti-liberal belief system. And of course, it is not about foreign policy only. Even more importantly, it is about social values, about religion, about family, uh, about foreign, alien, liberal values imposed in the process of globalization on Mother Russia. And Russia is not unique. There are more and more countries where such attitudes become more and more popular. Uh, but we are talking about Russian nationalism today, and I think that late Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Alexander Dugin, and many people in the Kremlin are all conservative and anti-liberal. And that helps to explain the difficulty that Washington has in understanding and dealing with Moscow today. There are different worldviews, and these excellent books helps us to better understand Russian worldview. I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, Igor, thank you very much. I, I feel... Um, I feel smarter just having listened to this uh, discussion. I, I think um, we've raised, again, some very interesting questions. Uh, one of the things that always strikes me about discussions of nationalism is there's this inherent irony because you're talking about a concept where each nation is unique, but the concept spans the world, right? So everybody's unique in their very own way, except that the, the forces that bring all of these unique ideas to power are always very similar. Right, so the the you know it's it's this uh, uniqueness that spans the world, and I think there's also a conservative thread that you get identified in most nationalisms, um, which is also kind of, it's worth unpacking. Um, but my uh, the question I'm going to ask with my moderator's prerogative before turning this over to the audience is a little bit more pragmatic and less philosophical. Um, both of you have talked a bit about how the Putin regime uses these tools reflects them, 
does or does not shape them. And I wonder, just, I, I, I too was struck by the March 2014 speech, you know, the use of um, Ruski, Vice Rasiski, all of that. I was also struck later by the walk back of the Novorossiya concept, kind of the, the dropping of it. And what I wonder if, and I know that this is speculative, but I wonder both of you, how much do you think Putin, the folks around him, the people who are making these policies, how well do they think they understand this set of tools? Do they think they know how this works? Or are they also a little bit nervous and a little bit uncertain about the forces that get unleashed and just how easy or difficult it is to get them back into their boxes? So I'm just wondering if you could comment. Um, no, that's that's a great question. I mean, how how much does um, does the Kremlin really understand what it does when it uses nationalism? Um, and I, I think I think there's a certain arrogance. I mean, there's the, about um, you know the sort of political spin doctors in the Kremlin who um, use national. You know, they'll say, well, okay, let's put this in a speech and um, you know use it as a as a way to you know uh, as a political the the tool of domestic political consolidation or something and then and then we can just sort of forget about it and dial it back when it um, when we don't need it anymore and I think there's not an appreciation of the power of nationalist ideas and once they you know once they're on once they get into the political mainstream um, they tend to uh, they're they're like a virus they chase everything out uh, as, as the the quote um, from from Gellner uh, that I read uh, kind of indicates the nationalism just there seems to be something about nationalism that in certain situations it just tends to take over um, and it's not because the nationalists are better, it's not because they're more capable, um, it's because there's something inherent about nationalism that's stronger than other ideas. And it's not because it's a better idea, it's obviously in most cases it's not a better idea. But um, but yeah, I, I think there, there's, there's uh, there's been an, we've seen an arrogance in the Kremlin about using nationalism as a, I mean, they even have a, a term for it um, under, um, uh, you know, in, in the, the first uh, two terms of, of Putin's um, rule, uh, they, they called it upravlaimi nationalism, you know, managed nationalism. It, that's something that um, was used as a way, a, after the first Ukraine revolution, um, uh, the Kremlin seemed to want to use nationalism as a way to um, confront a, the prospect of a, of a similar kind of orange revolution in, in Russia. Um, they needed to have, you know, youth gangs and, and um, to, 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 you know, confront, uh, you know, the, the, the orange revolutionaries who never actually really showed up in the streets. Um, and, and so they used, they recruited, um, you know, skinheads and they recruited nationalists and, uh, and they kind of used this, uh, this concept to kind of whip up a, 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 a they, 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 they held the, the first uh, Russian march in 2005, um, which was uh, uh, actually uh, started by, by Alexander Dugan um, as a way to guide and use and manage nationalism as in a to 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 recruit it as a kind of a pro-state force and then uh, later on the russian march that that was started as a pro-kremlin project became a totally anti-kremlin project and i think they they didn't understand that this um thing that they were unleashing um was uh, they didn't understand how it works, and it's the same you have in in, in many countries. You know, uh, when when governments in the Middle East play with Islamic politics, they don't realize how they're you know what they're unleashing. When Pakistan you know uh, backs uh, the Taliban, uh, and then the Taliban um, come back and uh, uh, become a, an anti-state force in in Pakistan, uh, they didn't you know that they, they you you you. You let the tiger go, and then you don't. You can't control the tiger, and I think that's happening in, to some extent in in Russia today. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I think the Kremlin understands Russian nationalism very well, way better than I do. Uh, I think uh, 
that uh, it doesn't control the movement in full, but influences it. There is a lot of back and forth between uh, theoretical, intellectual, and street nationalism and different governmental agencies. And I think that it is very well shown in the book how at some point this or that movement acquires a curator from a governmental agency with whom they interact. So the, sometimes uh, there are blunders and mistakes, but generally speaking, uh, the Kremlin has been very successful, from my perspective, in managing Russian nationalism. I was very worried at the moment when those who fought in eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass, started coming back to Russia. And you might compare this to sort of, probably it's a stretch, but still to the returning jihadists a concern for all security agencies in Europe and uh, around the world. So uh, with Mr. Strelkov and other characters coming back to Russia, Russia seemed to become not a safe place. But it did not happen. The process of establishing control over them uh, brought fruit, and it was very successful. It is managed, it is controlled, and they're put back to the shelf in the cupboard in general. From time to time, there are mistakes. It's a di uh, difficult process, but it's a successful policy. Thank you, Igor. I, I, I wonder, yeah, I, I do wonder how long they stay on the shelf. I, I've met a few of these guys, and they... They certainly continue to have an agenda. So, you know, kind of their ability to do something with it. Those who are not in prison. Many those of who are, them are those behind who are not bars. In prison, yes. we, we know a lot about uh, the liberals and Balotna Plochet protesters mm -hmm. being imprisoned. They speak English, their friends have connections to foreign mm -hmm. correspondents, and so on and so forth. We know much less about the nationalists uh, behind bars. But again, sorry to kind of continue on this theme, but the uh, parallel with the jihadists, right? When you put jihadists in prison, they recruit other jihadists. My guess is when you put nationalists in prison, they recruit other nationalists. That's certainly the experience in the West. So again, uh, and not everyone stays in prison forever. And if you've been radicalized in prison, you're generally a pretty dangerous person when you come out. OK, I'm going to turn this to the audience. And Andy has his hand up. And the microphone will come around. Please do formulate a question. And please do get, state your name and your affiliation. Um, Andy Cutchins, Georgetown University. Uh, thanks, Charles and, uh, and Eager, for uh, excellent uh, uh, presentations and, and Olga for putting the program together. Um, I, I, I have two comments that uh, maybe I can formulate them as a question, but and I apologize because I missed the first five minutes or so of your present presentation, Charles, but I, I came in when you were talking about Eurasian war fighting and that the last 15 years all fighting has been done in a defined geographic area. And it sounded to me like you're implying that, some, that what's been happening in the last 15 years is something new and different. And I think, that's, I think that's kind of a myth. I was just reading a paper, making comments on a paper, made a similar argument about that. And I think we, you know, look what happened at the collapse of the, so the so Soviet Union in 1991, 92, 93, when Russian military, regular and ir irregular forces, intelligence services were intervening in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, um, uh, Taj the, the, the Tajik Civil War. I mean, this was a pretty active set of set of policies. Now, maybe the Russian government was taking advantage of the time, and that uh, there was, they still had more military forces and intelligence forces in those places. And but nevertheless, the seeds of and uh, I'll put Nagorno-Karabakh in the same category, although of course that the seeds of that predate the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so I, I don't see that this is something necessarily something new. And in fact, I think it, you can look at the Soviet period and the and the Tsarist period as well, and this sort of idea of Eurasian fighting or fighting in this certain space, you know, I think what Al, the historian Al Reber would refer to as one of the um, enduring factors or challenges 
of uh, Russian and Soviet foreign policy, and that being having uh, porous borders uh, with mixed ethnic groups on the on the on the borders. So, I think that you know to say that the these were this sort of war fighting style is, is sort of is tied to the uh, uh, the ideas of Eurasianism that uh, were emerging in the 1920s. Um, you know, I, I would raise question about that. Now, more more t more to your to your argument, I guess. Um, you know, your comment that Russia reacted very differently in 2004 uh, to Ukraine than in 2013, 20, 2014, and that 10 years later Russia was ready to sacrifice economic goods. Uh, and you're kind of questioning what is what is the the definition of pragmatism? Well, I think for the a political leader, the de a definition of pragmatism is remaining in power. In power, and I know why Putin made decisions in 2013, 2014 versus 2004 are are not necessarily so hard to come by. I think, I think particularly when he came back to the presidency uh, in May of 2012, um, you know he'd been popular for most of the time that he'd been in power, or de, de facto and or de jure because of economic growth and prosperity. Um, but to me, it looked like he was kind of began to turn away from that as a key foundation of his political authority and credibility as soon as, you know, six months after he returned to power because it was clear that he wasn't going to pursue economic reforms that would put Russian economic growth on a more sustainable path. You know, Russian economic growth in 2013 is already 1.3 percent by the, on the eve of uh, Crimea and the war in the Donbass, Russian economic growth is already zero, despite the fact that oil prices are over $100 a barrel and no economic sanctions have been inflict imposed. Now, so he had less economically to lose. I think also he was more disenchanted with the idea of integration with the West and a lot of disappointment on that, on that score. Um, and, he'd been, and he'd been cultivating already for a couple of years this idea of what Eager referred to as, as uh, you know, Russian uh, national conservat conservatism, I, I would argue. So this was, this was happening, then it was, it was crystallized, I think, in the decisions that were taken in the spring of, of, 20, of 2014 and what, what that meant. So I guess, I think, you know, it's, a, it's very important to look at the ideas, the setup ideas that are out there. Eager and I wrote a chapter for a, a, a volume that looked at uh, various, um, you know, and we put it to, we went to publication in 2010, 2011, and we cautioned that there was a, you know, there was some concern, that a danger that ideas of, of various ideas of nationalism could emerge as sort of the leading as the leading school of thought in Russian foreign policy. That, that happened, we didn't predict it, but it was, it was a possibility. So the leader, sorry, just I'll conclude on this. You know, the leader is, is a, he's a policy entrepreneur, and he, there is a, there is a, a palette of, of ideas out there that, that exist that, you know, he or she can, can pick and choose from that, you know, in a different social and economic and political context, you know, seem to, you know, make more sense for him or her to, you know, continue their, continue their rule. Now, I think in the, in the case of Mr. Putin, did he anticipate that the oil price was going to collapse? Nobody did at the end of 2014. He probably underestimated the, uh, the likelihood of, uh, of the European Union uh, and the West uh, remaining unified on much tougher economic sanctions. But, you know, if you don't shoot down MH17, maybe that doesn't happen. So there's a lot of contingency. I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, let's take two more questions before getting, going back to the panelists. And um, Catherine? Hi, I'm Kathy Kosman, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I was hoping that you could expand a bit more on the role of the Moscow Patriarchate in, in this process, especially because Putin referred rather prominently to orthodoxy as a key factor in the Ruski Mir, expanding it also to, I believe, include Belarus, as well as Ukraine, and of course Crimea as the uh, play, or Kherson as the place where Volodymyr was baptized. Thank you. And um, uh, yeah, that's fine, Marjorie. 
Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Georgetown University. Uh, one of the elements that's sort of lurking here, but maybe could be brought out a little bit more explicitly, is issues of Russian nationalism and context in terms of the interaction with other ethnic groups, in addition to East Slavs or Northern Kazakhstan. So I'd, I'd love it if you could focus a little bit more on the interrelationship of Russians and, say, the North Caucasus, uh, the, the interactive um, and possibly polarizing dynamic that creates nationalisms on multiple sides is, is part of a lot of the theory of nationalism that, that's out there. Thanks. Okay, Charles. Okay. Um, yeah, well, in, in response to the first question, I, I think, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. There, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the, the only reason for these uh, momentous things that have happened, these wars, uh, uh, and and policy responses to major crises are, are that you know Putin's been sitting around reading um, some fairly arcane journals, um, uh, or uh, that he's under somebody's influence. I, I don't think he he is, and I agree with you that he's a, a policy entrepreneur. He he picks and chooses uh, what works or what he thinks might work, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. But um, uh, my 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 only point is in in focusing on the context uh, rather than on Putin's own decision making is to say that I think the context is 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 the primary thing that he's obviously trying to increase his power and he's trying to uh, or maintain his power and that's his primary goal. I totally agree with that. Um, but um, you know when you, when you're maintaining your your power, you're doing it in a, in a kind of a social system which is the Russian elite. And it's very important what the Russian elite is thinking and what books they're reading or what um, ideas are, you know, are, you know what, what buzzwords are being used on TV. Um, and that process is a very indirect process and a very poorly understood process. And I totally agree with Igor that, that Putin doesn't actually set the intellectual agenda of Russia as much as we may uh, think. Um, that this intellectual agenda is something, I think I understood that point properly. Um, this intellectual agenda is something that um, is is something that that uh, nobody really seems to control, and um, it seems to periodically, um, uh, you know, uh, became a, a very strange place. <laughs> and so, um, now obviously there are, there are uh, rational political reasons for for fighting these wars um, where they've fought them, and I'm not certainly suggesting that uh, Russia's never fought a war before or anything, but um, the the places where these wars have happened, I think, is in, in the last um, 10, 15 years, and where they haven't happened, is is something that I think deserves some attention. Um, the 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 line that they you know. There, there are a hundred reasons why they might have fought wars um, where they did and why they might not have fought wars in you know, uh, other places. Um, but I'm just saying that there's a very strange coincidence that this, um, this red line that um, was drawn in a, in a journal article in 1926 seems to also be, um, a, a, a may, you know, seems to exist, uh, you know, can, you can, Put it on a map, and you can see that actually, well, uh, this this may explain something. Um, it's it's a kind of an interesting, maybe more um, poetic uh, observation than anything uh, of strategic value. But um, it's it's something that um, I, I just found it compelling enough to to, to bring it up. Um, as far as uh, as the patriarch, the Orthodox patriarchy and the Orthodox Church is a factor, and I mean, obviously, they have um, the the Orthodox Church in a very conservative, muscular version of, of Orthodox Christianity uh, has become um, a, a very key part of um, the ideological program of the Kremlin, um, especially since uh, Putin returned for his third term. Um, there are certain figures in the church who are especially powerful or, or especially influential in the Kremlin. Those aren't necessarily the top people in the church, um, but uh, the, the, the you know the the, the patriarch is um, uh, is uh, you know is quite. Uh, they, 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 I would say that the church is used as a symbol. I wouldn't say the church necessarily has. I haven't seen much evidence that the church has the ability to set the agenda anywhere, um, except with you know liquor laws and things like you know social issues. The church uh, does have a voice, but um, uh, 
on anything uh, related, you know, there, there's no, you know, as much as um, the, the word uh, symphony of church state power tends to find its way into official speeches and things which, which implies a kind of co, you know, uh, which implies some sort of political power given to the church or some sort of role for the church in politics. I don't see a the, the, the church having a strong political role. Um, and then on the question of, of nationalism at, at the local level, um, I think that's, that's all, you know, that's, that's such an interesting thing because nationalism everywhere that I've seen it, um, that I've seen it happen, it always happens first, uh, you know, on the neighborhood level. Um, and um, it's, it's something that policymaker, or that, that, that powerful politicians and political entrepreneurs tend to react to but they see it, it, it tends to sort of happen organically um, first, and then it happens, uh, you know, in some speech or some TV spot or something, and then it kind of gets reflected back and forth and back and forth, and it happens very, very quickly, and it happens uh, blindingly fast. And, um, and then once it's out there, it's out there, and you can't do anything about it, which is, which is too bad. But, um, uh, but certainly um, local nationalism um, and uh, you know Russian Caucasian antagonism uh, is a huge social factor in um, many cities in Russia, and it's something that um, both uh, I mean the 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 the, anti the the opposition tends to play on this antagonism quite quite effectively. Uh, it's something that I think the uh, the the the, the uh, Kremlin is is doing its best to kind of try and and have a position on and handle, um, but it's a, it's certainly some it's a, it's a major major social factor in Russia. Uh, at least it was when uh, two years ago when I was working there. <laughs> so, uh. very briefly, uh, the first uh, and his comment and uh, question. I agree, uh, of course, that domestic political goals and uh, staying in in power. I the feeling that. The West is encircled, is encircling Russia, and, and uh, it's the West already came to Ukraine, and you know Russia is shrinking, uh, and the Russian world is shrinking. This is the vision, and it was already by 2014 was very different uh, than 10 years before during the first color revolution. So to a significant extent, it was a defensive action to intervene in Ukraine, to prevent the West to dominate uh, the most important part of the Russian world, namely Ukraine, though it is nominally an independent state. So, uh, and this vision, is, uh, it doesn't make sense to argue what is more important, domestic political considerations or this vision. They are mutually constitutive. Uh, they are intermingled. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with Charles' uh, comments on the role of uh, the church. It is one of important skrepa, as in Russian, or uh, bonds, one of important bonds for Russia, and it is used instrumentally, and there is very mutually uh, beneficial coexistence um, between uh, the political uh, power and uh, the church. A very important question raised by uh, Margie about interaction with uh, other ethnic groups, with other nationalisms. Uh, it looked like Everyone agreed uh, before 2012-2014 uh, that the tension was on the rise between uh, Russians and other ethnic groups uh, within Russia, and that was uh, and that fueled this ethnic nationalism. But it looks like it's not as hot issue today as it used to be uh, several years ago for two major reasons. First, this revival of neo-imperial layer of Russian identity, and the second is very practical. Uh, it's just out-migration of labor workers from large Russian cities back to Central Asia, to North Caucasus, to Southern Caucasus, and so on. So, uh, so this tension 
eased a little bit. So, Kate. Um, as I was listening to sort of uh, how you defined imperialist as opposed to ethnic nationalism um, and how, you know, one gets put on the shelf and then t the other gets taken down and sort of uh, that cycle and you see that continue into the future. I was wondering if that perhaps um, played a role in controlling the rise of nationalism itself because then you know there's not one singular movement that's that's going to be there for a large period of time and perhaps that um, could keep groups that are proponents of one or the other from uh, sort of uh, gaining too much influence and too much power and I was wondering if there might be some strategic um, advantage to keeping that line sort of hazy and and not constant. Um, let's go up front here. Thank you, Irv Chapman. I've been with Bloomberg. In view of your contrasting statements relating to the goals of Russian nationalism, uh, how do you evaluate the Russian threat to the Baltic states and NATO's uh, reaction to it? And since you've been in China more recently, how do you contrast Chinese growing nationalism with what the Russians have been up to? And uh, Gil? Gil Rosman, uh, the Asan Forum. Um, I want to follow up that China point. Um, there seems to be very little Asia in your discussion of Eurasianism. And uh, Charles, it, there was an indication that you're coming from Beijing. So I'd like, presumably, some years from now, you'll be writing the parallel <laughs> book. And so, uh, although I can't ask you to anticipate your findings, I'm wondering how much you see um, the communist background in, in, this, in Russia uh, with parallels to China uh, as uh, influential in shaping this new identity. You didn't talk about it as if it is some legacy of, of that. Um, and um, so much of what you said just sounds like the civilizational opposition to the West and what Igor said, too, about uh, the vision uh, parallels Chinese views. You know, the, China is uh, supposedly on the defensive, preserving core interests, struggling to, against Western liberal ideas. Does this bring Russia and China more together, and do you see any implications of the identity themes you're discussing uh, for that? considering that for 20 years or so, the main Chinese thrust, the Russian Soviet thrust in attacking identity differences was China, the threat to, to their own identity. All right, good set. Okay. Um, so the, the first question on, on the, the various definitions of nationalism um, and the implications for, for um, you know, which type of nationalism is being accented and when and whether there's some, um, rationale for that and whether there's some implications for that. And I think I, I've purposefully kind of glossed over, I've, I've, the, my, my treatment of nationalism is, is not very rigorous in this book, and I, I'm the first to admit that. And I think Igor has done a very good job of, of teasing out the strands of, of what um, you know, the, the certain types of nationalists said and, and how they were different of nationalism, you know, often within five minutes of, <laughs> of saying a completely different thing. Uh, they'll say something that, well, oh, actually, uh, I thought you were an imperial nationalist, but uh, no, um, you're now a, 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 you know, an ethnic nationalist or something. Um, there is a very, there are very little appreciation. I mean, if you if you take you know Mr. Zhirinovsky's political career, for example, or Mr. Dugin's, or any of these guys, there there are various points at which they're you know they seem to be primarily making um, uh, you know uh, defending traditional ethnic Russian civilization or uh, identity or uh, defending, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, they're talking about Russia as the third Rome, uh, the, the, the inheritor of the orthodox faith, um, or they're talking about a pan-ethnic uh, Eurasian concept of, of Eurasianism or, or something. The, the, there's, I think, in, in embedded in the idea of nationalism is almost a an, the idea that we don't have to 
live with the contradictions of the various things that we're saying. We can just say them and they become true. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think Putin has, has made a career of reinventing himself every year as something different. Um, uh, and I guess my argument would be that when you let the, you know, that nationalism is somehow different from all other ideologies is that when you let it out of the bottle, it becomes an independent force uh, in politics and it makes everybody in the political system behave according to its logic. Now what logic that is, <laughs> as I've just said, is very hazy uh, and very full of contradictions uh, and it's not something that we understand very well. Um, but I, I totally agree with your point that there is uh, something to be, there's, there's, um, it, it's, it's definitely important to pay attention to um, the, the definitions, uh, the self-definitions of, of what concept of identity people are, are talking about. Um, now, uh, the second question, um, sorry, I've just written down, um, it was about the Baltics, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, if uh, I'm right, and, and uh, the Russian leadership that, um, you know, the Baltics are in NATO, um, they're, there is an understanding in the Kremlin that that, that, is, that makes them different. Um, you're, you, you might fool around with them a little bit, but you, you know, they're not gonna get invaded. Um, so uh, again, that uh, you know, comes with the in incre incredibly big caveat that you know, if I'm right, um, which may not be the case. Um, so the, the third question was about China uh, and um, the, the, the civilizational argument that the Chinese make. This is extremely important and it's not something that, um, that I, I wrote about in my book. It's something that I've been doing some research on while I've, I'm, I've been in Beijing for the last uh, two and a half years. And um, uh, yes, there are very important coincidences between the Chinese uh, concept of the civilization state and think in, indeed I think that is a, a word that, that Xi Jinping has used um, in speeches, uh, the, the Chinese concept of a civilizational identity and the Russian concept of a civilizational identity and the Chinese self-definition of its own strategic interests with a, a Russian definition of their own strategic interests. These, both of these countries are um, large strategic actors with a lot of weapons and very big armies um, who feel that their political role in the world is not commensurate to their, uh, the, the, the role that they've been given by the global system is not commensurate to what they uh, uh, deserve. Uh, and that um, the arguments made by both, they, they both have a, an idea of a, of a sphere of influence that they seek to, um, uh, control, uh, that the, 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 the Russia has said that it has a, a sphere of influence or a zone of special influence, I think they've called it, um, in some countries in its neighboring region, but they haven't actually been clear, uh, at least publicly, about what those countries and where that line is. Um, the Chinese have said that they have a, a special zone of influence in the South China Sea, is called the, the Nine Dash Line. Um, there was a uh, a tribunal, an arbitration tribunal that's, that uh, a few days ago said that this uh, line doesn't exist and it's, uh, you know, and the Chinese have gotten very angry about this. But both of these are countries that um, believe that um, the U.S. has spheres of influence and they believe that the U.S. Um, behaves like a big country and throws its weight around and they're big countries too and they should be able to throw their weight around and, and, um, and that they are not being given their due and um, intensively. Um, is that going to create, uh, you know, is that going to drive them further towards each other into a sort of a military alliance? It's possible. Um, it's not something I would want to rule out. China has a taboo on, you know, it's in the Chinese expert community, uh, there are voices who are pro-alliance. And when they're talking about alliances, they're talking about Russia because there's really only one country that, that would have any deterrent value that China could ally with, uh, and that is Russia. On the other hand, um, you know, in the Chinese view, uh, it would be a total, you know, Russia would be a total liability <laughs> if they were to ally. You know, they're, they're very concerned about the path that Russia is taking, 
um, that they, they believe that, that Russia is doing a lot of things that are contrary to their long-term political and economic interests, and they don't really understand why. Um, so if you're in a military alliance with Russia and then Russia decides to invade some country, like, what do you do? Uh, but, um, so, sorry, this is a very, very long answer, but it's a very interesting question. Um, and i um, be happy to talk more about it uh, later. But um, I, I do see important parallels. I don't see, um, you know, in, in Russia and China, I don't see uh, uh, this ending in, in, a, in a strategic alliance or anything like that, though. Uh, I don't have much time to answer three great questions. I mean, probably one minute per question, yeah, right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, of course, uh, there is no singular nationalist movement in Russia, uh, and the strength uh, of nationalism uh, is not uh, in uh, unity. Uh, the strength is that it is present in all, in the programs and visions of all political forces, including, uh, well, uh, Alexei Navalny was mentioned, we may add uh, Vladimir Milov and other liberals, who, uh, well, uh, share some moderate nationalist views uh, with um, uh, other nationalists. And of course, the Kremlin is very interested in maintaining uh, this uh, deliberate ambiguity about nationalism and uh, the uh, differences between different kinds of nationalism. But the Kremlin has not created it. It just uses uh, this disunity uh, instrumentally. Uh, the second question is uh, about the Baltic states. Uh, if you look at quote unquote, and I always put uh, the word objective in quote uh, marks. So if you look at objective factors uh, in the Baltic states, particularly in Latvia and Estonia, uh, well, uh, there are some elements that make, uh, you know, uh, politicians in these countries and uh, among their NATO uh, allies nervous. If you look at uh, the Russian world, the Russian diasporas, particularly living not in the capitals, uh, where they successful, well adapted, uh, and integrated, many of them. Uh, but if you look at places like Narva uh, in Estonia or Daugavpils in uh, uh, Latvia, you may become worried if you are a member of uh, the security service in these countries. But uh, there is a huge thing. NATO is taking more seriously in Moscow than in many European uh, capitals or, uh, well, across the Atlantic. It is taken really seriously. And that balances, uh, you know, those, uh, those worries. And, uh, uh, and I have always argued for uh, the governments of these states can do a better job in in their efforts to integrate uh, Russian communities in these countries. Uh, uh, just to add to Charles' uh, answer to Gil's question uh, about, uh, uh, about the communist background and the Soviet legacy in uh, treating and using nationalisms, the nationalism in modern day Russia. Uh, there are some parallels and many differences between modern Russian approach to these issues, uh, official approach and the Soviet uh, approach. Uh, the main Soviet era legacy in this area, from my perspective, is a primordialist uh, attitude towards uh, ethnicity. So, and it can be traced back to Bramley and Gumilov. So, the ethnicity treated as a, as a and actually nation uh, is perceived uh, as something uh, that uh, has common ancestry, uh, blood ties, and so on and so forth. This is the legacy. A huge difference is that the Soviet Union failed to recognize uh, the Soviet people as a nation. There are many differences for that. While Russia has no problem for, uh, with that, uh, and uh, there is a Russian nation. Uh, and this is a huge, uh, huge uh, difference with the Soviet uh, period uh, of time. 
Great. I think we'll take one last round. Um, Jeff? Thanks. Um, Jeff Mankoff with CSIS. Charles, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the transmission belt behind these ideas. Um, because you mentioned at the beginning that some of these writers were um, kind of bohemians in cafes um, earlier on, and presumably not a lot of people were reading their work. Um, and you said a lot of people in the Kremlin even today probably haven't read their work. And I'm guessing that a lot of the nationalist activists who are coming out on the street and, and protesting and who are the raw material for this nationalist movement haven't read their work either. So how do the ideas that these cafe intellectuals produce in the 1980s or the 1990s become a force that is driving the highest levels of Russian politics both at home and abroad? Hello, I'm Nadezhda Smachtina at National Security Archive. Um, my question is based on what you said in your presentation, and you may correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that um, 10 years ago and now there, are, there is a driving force that is basically pragmatism that drives um, Putin and the Russian government towards what they're doing, especially in Ukraine. And you mentioned that 10 years ago it was primarily economical reason. It was economically driven pragmatism. Uh, what do you think drive pragmatism right now in Russia? Thank you. Uh, my name is Yuri. I am the editor of the Rafabula journal, Ruska Fabula. Uh, you know, I have a few uh, friends among Russian nationalists, and I uh, cannot agree that uh, Eurasianism and uh, great uh, uh, Russia statism can be called nationalism. But anyway, uh, maybe we should maybe pay more attention to uh, a really new kind of Russian nationalism, that is liberal nationalism, which is represented by Alexei Navalny, uh, Alexander Belov, Alexei Sharapayev, Ilya Zarenka, and many others, which is uh, actually, which they participated in the Balotnya protests and all, all other protests there, pro-Western, pro-Ukrainian, even pro-Israel. Thank you. Let's uh, try to answer those. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, as far as the, uh, Jeff, you mentioned the, the, transmission, the transmission belt of these ideas, and that, that's something that I'm still <laughs> extremely curious about, and I tried to, um, uh, that, that was one of the things that I was trying to get at when I was writing this book, was to talk to the people who wrote the, the books, and then talk to the people who published the books, and um, other people who were kind of in politics during that time who were, you know, for instance, um, working as, as, you know, spin doctors and, and uh, or working for Russian TV stations or, you know, how did these ideas get out of, you know, they were written in these fairly obscure journals and blogs and, um, and you know, and it is quite compelling. The, the word, the buzzwords, you know, like Eurasia or, um, you know, cultural genetic code or, um, Civilizations. I mean, civilization is something that you know <laughs> that's not exclusive to this particular group of of nationalists. But um, you know, the arguments, the, the the figures that they cite, like Halford Mackinder, uh, you know, uh, British uh, expert on geopolitics, who has become this kind of huge figure. <laughs> he's he's. I mean, he's an important academic um, in the you know in in the sort of early part of the 20th century. But he's um, been written about as though he's some sort of Cardinal Richelieu of you know. Um, the Anglo-American policymaking, or something. Um, you know, how did these uh, these these thinkers and these uh, ideas get into the mainstream? And I, I, I mean, I honestly, <laughs> I, I draw a bit of a blank because um, you know you have somebody like Nikolai Patrushev quoting uh, Mackinder, and the person who introduced Mackinder into the main into Russian. Reading public was was Dugin, and um, you know, ten years later, Patrushev, uh, you know, quotes him in an interview. Um, and uh, why? How did? They, where? Where did? You know, obviously, I don't think Patrushev has time to read books. I think he gets you know synopsis of things and stuff. But you know, somebody uh, maybe you know somebody around him may have picked up a. You know, why does he say that? I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I, but I, I do find, I think your, your, your question is a great one because it focuses on, um, you know, 
one of the driving forces of, of politics is the transmission belt for ideas, and we don't really know how it works. Um, so um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to say that's a really important point you've made, um, and I've tried to write a book about it. <laughs> uh, and I've tried to answer it in that book, but I'm not sure how well I did, uh, except to kind of narrate the process by which some of these ideas uh, entered the mainstream and who was mentioning them, uh, mentioning them, and when. Um, now, as far as your question about pragmatism, what what is pragmatism? And you know, and I think. Um, you know, pragmatism, I think we, we said earlier, I mean, it, it, I think we can all agree that, that Putin's approach to pragmatism is how to stay in power. Um, but how to stay in power, the question of how to stay in power has, has, has changed um, fundamentally in, um, in a decade. Uh, how to stay in power means how to preserve a very delicate consensus among the elite um, and how to kind of bridge balances and things, but I think it's, it's I would say, rather than being a, a, a primarily a, a political problem, um, staying in power for Putin is a social problem. It's, it's, you have to balance clans and you have to balance um, powerful figures uh, within the Kremlin, and for, for whatever reason, uh, the way to do that is, um, is, is to be a, a nationalist now. Um, the, the context for being a pragmatist is now answering the question, what sort of nationalist are you going to be? Um, rather than um, previously the, the answer, you know, the context for being a pragmatist is how do you, you know, ensure economic growth? Um, though, you know, obviously the, the political and economic situation is, uh, the, the, today is, is much different than it was in the middle of the last decade. So uh, I, I take that point that was made earlier uh, uh, by, by, by you. Um, now, um, uh, sorry, I'm uh, liberal, nationalism. liberal nationalism. I mean, nationalism is uh, a very, very big thing. Um, <laughs> it includes a lot of, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I was aware when I wrote this book that I was calling Eurasianism nationalism. In Russian, nationalism is something totally different, and all of these national, all of these, you know, it's it's anybody who's an ethnic nationalist or a, you know, a sectarian or uh, somebody who believes, you know, who's an irredentist or who believes that they're, um, you know, anybody who kind of, broadly speaking, speaks about national identity as a driver of politics. I mean, that's kind of. Um, the, my definition for nationalism, but I mean, I you know, in reading this literature, and I only read like one tiny percent of of what's out there. Um, you know, I've totally ignored uh, Yegor Prasvirin, who I think is probably the most important nationalist in Russia today. Uh, he was just coming on the scene as I was leaving, um, but uh, I'm struck by how totally diverse. Um, you know, whether these guys have anything in common at all is a question worth asking. Um, but, uh, you know, the, there's a, a lot of different types of nationalism and a lot of, you know, and, and in a sense, uh, you know, there's liberal nationalism, there's conservative, there's imperial, there's ethnic. Um, but it's, it's a huge, huge uh, pool to swim in, so. Uh, very quickly, Jeff is leaving, but I uh, plan to uh, <laughs> uh, to answer uh, Jeff's question about the transmission belt. There are two ways to address this question. The one way, so-called metaphysical, and to say there is something in the air, and so it influences, you know, uh, everyone, including the leaders. And the second is uh, approach is very down to earth. Uh, what happens is actually people in the presidential administration, uh, people in the National Security Council and in the analytical departments of FSB you know, read those books uh, and uh, this terminology, these ideas in a very, well, of course, brief and simplified way uh, make their way to their short policy memos and it goes uh, upward and uh, it is compared with uh, opinion polls and seeing what is uh, beneficial or not and then the leader use it. Yeah, Jeff. <laughs> uh, the second question about pragmatism uh, and uh, pragmatism and 
ideology are not mutually exclusive. And uh, every ideologue uh, would call himself or herself a pragmatist. You're using this term when applied to a Russian reality, especially if you are a Russian speaker, many times it feels awkward to call this or that movement or politician or thinker a nationalist. In Russian, it doesn't play that way at all. And the second part of your question, about liberal nationalism, I think that if and when the political system opens up, this is the most liberal nationalist. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually a really good note to close on. So uh, I'd like to ask the audience to join me in thanking our panelists.